Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our webinar on pelvic floor neuromonitoring. We're very excited. We have over 400 people, and perhaps even more importantly, we have over 41 countries represented. How exciting. Our schedule includes 30 minutes for Dr. Jahangiri to present the neurophysiologist perspective, followed by 30 minutes for Ms. Overzet to present the technologist perspective. One thing we know from the scientific literature of neuromonitoring from around the world, the efficacy of the outcome highly correlates to the uniform teamwork between all the different the, the surgeon, the OR staff, the neurophysiologist, the technologist. We're very excited to have two of those very important functions represented here. Our presenter specifically asked for a short 30 minute session of their talk so that we could have a longer interactive question and answer session, which we're quite excited about. I will just briefly say that my friend, Faisal Jahangiri, Dr. Jahangiri, I am safe to say he is the hard, hardest working individual I know in our industry. He is relentless at maintaining a, an intense schedule of new study, new publications, new presentations, new educational material. And if you know him, you know that he's willing to speak with anyone in our industry. Um, uh, over the six years that I've gotten to know Katie, um, I've found her to have an infectious passion for neuroscience as evidenced by her uh, bachelor and master in primary neuroscience. Um, and she is well published and we're excited to have her. She's a frequent educator, very good at what she does. I will say that I've been fortunate enough to seek out um, uh, heavy peer-reviewed, well-peer-reviewed uh, literature, review articles, um, uh, books from physicians, from neurophysiologists. There's, there are two things that always present for me, pelvic floor innervation and even pelvic floor anatomy. That information is still being developed. My point, we still have a lot to learn. With that, I hand it off to uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Jahangiri. Thank you, thank you, Brett, for the inviting for uh, giving a talk here. And uh, I'm first thing I want to disclose that I am still learning. So this is a, as you said, this is a new field, and uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. So this is a new field for all of us, and we have still a lot of different topics to explore, the anatomy, the physiology, the pathology, and how we can help the, sur the surgeons uh, to minimize the deficit which can occur um, during the surgeries which inv involve these surgical procedures. So saying that uh, I don't have any conflict of interest to disclose at this point. So the learning outcome for this presentation, I'm trying to give a big over picture. It's very hard to have uh, full-scale training in 30 minutes, but uh, just to provoke the th thought process and uh, involve more people to getting, um, being part of this uh, new uh, surgical area where we can help the surgeons, the patient, and um, the community. So intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring helps in better patient outcome by minimizing the risk related to the functional status of the nervous system during surgical procedures. So as we know, uh, IUM alert to the surgical team during surgery can help them to identify the cause and take an immediate corrective actions. So, uh, learning about the advantage of IUM during pelvic floor procedures. So those are the, uh, so the purpose of IUM again, just um, is to reduce the incidence of iatrogenic injury and any randomly induced neurological injury to patient during surgical procedures. IEM consequently conferred possible benefit at many levels, including improved patient care, uh, reduce the time of temporary deficit, it reduces the revision procedures, it reduces rehabilitation and recovery time, it reduces the hospital stay and medical cost um, involved with that, it reduces the overall burden on the insurance, it also introduces the liability uh, by protecting the uh, patient as much as possible. 
So pelvic floor neuromonting, the structure of the autonomous nervous system are complex in the pelvis, and sometimes they're difficult to differentiate from each other. The IEM during pelvic floor surgeries can minimize the risk of nerve damage, and it can monitor the nerve function and can minimize consequences uh, consequential nerve damage and help in maintaining the quality of life of the patient post-operatively because these um, uh, as we're going to talk uh, in for next slides um, bowel and bladder are the most common um, structure and any deficit on those bowel function or bladder function can have a very uh, significant effect on the patient quality of life so neuromonitoring during pelvic surgeries can reduce the risk of incontinence. It also can reduce in uh, sexual uh, dysfunction. Uh, pelvic neuromonitoring can help in the variety of surgical procedures in the pelvis. I'm going to talk. So that there's a potential of injury. There are five regions of potential nerve injury that can be identified. You have superior hypogastric uh, plexus. We have hypogastric plexus nerves. We have inferior hypogastric plexus and in, inferior neurovascular bundles to the rectum and uh, urogenital organs and terminal pudendal nerve branches. So innovative techniques like pelvic floor neuromonitoring and important in laparoscopic surgery enable the surgeon to detect the complex neural network and verify these internal anal sphincter and urogenital functions. So very surgical procedure where we can do this type of monitoring includes a neurosurgical procedure, uh, quad equina tumors, tumor involving uh, anything near conus, uh, tethered cord re release procedure, in, including myoseal, meningoceal, uh, orthopedic surgery. So any orthopedic sur surgical procedure where sacral tumors involving those um, uh, um, the sympathetic parasympathetic plexus uh, at risk and also lateral spine procedure where the nerves, pudendal nerves and lateral nerves, they are at risk. Uh, general surgeries and colorectal, especially colorectal uh, tumor resections, uh, gynecological procedures including hysterectomy um, and urological procedure such as prostate surgery and prostate resections. So pelvic floor is a group of muscles and connective tissue in the pelvic area. These muscles support the organs in the pelvis like a sling. The organs in the area include bladder, vaginal cavity, the uterus in the female, and prostate in the man, and rectum, which is the area um, at the end of the large intestine. Um, bowel movements and bladder emptying are controlled by contracting and relaxing these muscles. The pelv pelvic floor disorder is common condition that affect both men and women of all ages. One in five people will suffer from pelvic floor disorder during their lifetime. And one, of th one third of all women and 50% of women over the age of 55 are currently affected by pelvic floor disorder. Researchers um, estimate almost 10% of these women will undergo surgery for urinary incontinence and conditions or pelvic organ prolapse during their lifetime. So looking at the anatomy of the pelvic floor, um, so, so we have uh, urinary bladder, bladder and the uh, bladder is, have a smooth muscle wall and it, uh, the trigon is the area where the bladder meets the ureter. Um, and we have internal urethral cat sphincter and external urethral sphincter. So the pudendal nerve is the main nerve supplying those areas. Uh, they can for controlling the urethral sphincter. Uh, it originates from S2, S3, S4, and very occasionally it also originates from S1 or some uh, sometime. The pelvic nerves, um, we have sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. The, so I'm going to go more detail later, but the function of the parasympathetic nervous system is to control the bladder by contracting uh, and contracting the smooth muscle and relaxing the, uh, the sphincter for urination. The, symp the sympathetic um, control the bladder relaxation. So when you're looking at the anatomy of the pelvic floor again, uh, the lower unit tract innervation, innervation and neurotransmitters. They are afferent and efferent fibers uh, covering the hypogastric uh, plexus, the pudendal nerves, uh, and parasympathetic neurotransmitters. So the, the 
So you have the roots which are coming from thoracolumbar cord and sacral cord. The thoracolumbar cord roots come from T, T1 to T2, uh, L2, and uh, for hypo, uh, for sacral root they come from S2 to S3. There are, there are clinical consequences of abnormal uh, urine storage and widening after severe upper motor neuron or suprascular spinal uh, cord injury. So even those surgical procedure they are not a pelvic floor procedure. But if there's a damage to the upper motor neurons, um, which is controlling uh, these muscles, that can have a consequence of the uh, bad outcome. So if it's, uh, in case of normal storage, an A fiber responds to gradual bladder distension. But in case of spinal cord injury, the overactive C fibers, afferent fibers fire spontaneously and it results in neurogenic deterioration overactivity. So if you have a neurogenic, a patient has a neurogenic bladder, patient will have a urine leakage for the rest of the life, decreased storage capacity, decreased compliance, and increased intravesicular pressure. So um, at the end, the recurrent urinary tract, um, it results in the recurrent UTI infections, uh, multi-drug use resistance. So patient will be on multiple uh, antibiotics and they will develop the resistance. The upper uh, urine tract infection and deterioration can also occur because if the patient has lower uh, UTI infection, it will spread to the upper UTI and can affect their kidneys as well. It will reduce the quality of life and the lifespan of the patient. So, so this is the, so we're just doing the first poll. So, So the most common types of pelvic floor disorders include pelvic organ prolapse, pelvic urinary incontinence, pelvic fecal incontinence, and pelvic floor. Before we decide and think about what we can monitor and uh, what's, um, what structure are at risk, so we go from the other side and we say, what are the clinical consequences of the damage to these nervous structure? And most of the time, those are the um, common type of disorder that we see in the clinical um, uh, patient in clinics, they come with a pelvic organ prolapse, multi single organ prolapse or multiple organ prolapse. They have urinary incontinence or they have fecal incontinence or they have pelvic floor. So the common modalities that can be used uh, to, to minimize the damage, uh, we can add pudendal nerve SSCP, we can add bulbocavernosis reflex or BCR. We can do motor evoke potential from uh, external urinary sphincter and uh, external uh, anal sphincter muscle. We can do EMG from external urinary sphincter and uh, external anal sphincter and internal anal sphincter. So those are the four modalities we can add to our uh, normal routine monitoring. So it's always better to have all the studies. Again, there's no one structure uh, study or one modality that can prevent um, the patient uh, to the maximum extent. So in order to give, give the patient the maximum benefit, we need to have a multi-modality monitoring because every, every modality has their pro and cons. So when we combine them, we get the maximum benefit. So bulbo uh, cavernosis reflex, bulbo cavernosis reflex is a reflex in the pudendal nerve, which cover the, the sensory roots, which are going to the spinal cord from the patient, uh, uh, from the patient in the patient and the reflex coming back from the spinal cord to the anal sphincter muscle. So we are going to, um, uh, to cover more on technical aspect, but so uh, BCR is useful in determining the functional status of the pudendal sensory motor reflex and conus medulla during surgical procedures. So all the surgical procedure where the pudendal nerve is at risk, we can add uh, BCR and the BCR will give us the, the information or the uh, reliability or functionality of the sensory root of the part of the pudendal nerve as well as the uh, motor part. So we do 
uh, by stimulating the dorsal surface of the penis in the ma ma male patient and inside the vulva on the female uh, by stimulating that and recording from the anal sphincter bilaterally. So the typical recommended method of stimulation parameters is ISI of 3 to 3.1 hertz, which is uh, 3, uh, 333 hertz. So, <clears throat> so ISI of, of 3, uh, 3 millisecond or th 333 hertz, train count of four or five pulses. The duration of the pulse should be about 500 microsecond. The current you can range from two to 50 milliampere, and you can do a single train stimulation and double train stimulation. When you do the double train stimulation, so you have to make sure you increase the uh, duration of the recording. So this is the waveform. So when you have a multiple train, uh, there are five pulses, stimulating with five pulses and recording from the left and the right anal sphincter and the bipolar. Uh, and you get two different waveforms. One is R1 and one is R2. Those are early and late waveforms. So those are recorded and uh, you can do continuous stimulation uh, along with other modalities. If you're looking at the stack of the BCR responses on the left, left BCR and right BCR, so the stimulation is in midline, so it's a unilateral stimulation, but uh, in midline. Uh, so it's very difficult to stimulate the left and right side. It's not possible, So, but the recording, you can do left and right separately recording. So you can have a pair of electrode on the left sphincter and a pair of electrode on the right sphincter. So put the another the second modality that can be uh, included in the pelvic floor mounting is pudendal nerve SSE. So doing the somatosensory evoke potential, but utilizing uh, pudendal nerve. So Hedman and all demonstrated that the amplitude of the pudendal SSP was maximal over sensory cortex at CPZ uh, for both men and women, and the latency of waveform are similar to those obtained uh, just as tibial but a little bit more uh, delayed. So the, the recording channel we use is CPZ to FPZ. Uh, you can add sub subcortical responses, but the subcortical responses are not as reliable, but uh, it's always good to have a subcortical responses uh, in those two. But the cortical responses, it look like, a, uh, the cortical responses look like a W, uh, uh, special, and uh, with the P40 down peak followed by N50 up peak and then P60 down peak. So, uh, so we can do continuous stimulation along with the other SSP and record. So if we have when you're doing bulbocam or PCR responses, we are doing monitoring the, uh, the reflex in the pelvic floor. But when we're doing potential nerve, we are monitoring the sensory route up to the uh, somatosensory cortex. So the other modality we can include is motor evoke potential. So motor evoke potential as are performed as a regular uh, stimulation and recording setup, but we you can add external anal sphincter and external unity sphincter. So now we can record from, uh, in the past we were doing just the anal sphincter EMG uh, motor evoke potential, but now we have capacity of recording external unit sphincter during um, pelvic floor surgeries or surgeries where the, uh, these structures are at risk. So this is the paper we published. So just giving you the uh, summary for that. So we had we did um, uh, multi-central uh, studies in five different medical centers in three different countries. And we had 15 patients with 47% uh, male, uh, female and 53% male. And the average uh, ranging from eight months to 66. 66 years old. And the type of surgical procedure we monitored were conus tumors, spinal cord tumors, tethered cord, and there's a one case where a patient has spinal stenosis. So upper, uh, for this surgical procedure, so we had upper and lower SSCP, upper and lower MEP, spontaneous EMG from external anal sphincter and external urethral sphincter and lower uh, extremity muscles bilaterally. A uh, catheter was used for which has attached urethral electrode uh, on the Foley catheter for recording MAP from from uh, from external unit sphincter. Uh, train of thought was used from the foot muscle, and uh, 
the appropriate site of your district getter should be used per patient age. So we cannot have one electrode. Which, so when you're um, doing the monitoring or you know the patient age, so you have to make sure you have the appropriate size of the Foley catheter. And uh, the typical, uh, the uh, Foley catheter are measured in uh, French scale and FR. And uh, the, each unit is roughly equivalent to 0.33 millimeter in diameter. So if you have an 18 franc uh, 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 catheter, that means the diameter is six millimeter. So every single unit is 0.33 millimeter. The youth catheter, uh, the size option, we have size eight and 10 for the children. And the Foley catheters used for adults is 14, 16, and 18. They are come in different sizes and they are bipolar electrodes. So you can use, uh, except for the eight franc, which is a monopolar probe, but 10, 12, 14, all the Foley catheters uh, embedded electrode, they are bipolar electrode. So, so recording the motor evoke potential from, uh, and also for spontaneous EMG from the blood electrode. So when we place these electrode, they are in contact with the ex external uh, urinary sphincter of the bladder and the, the, the muscles for the male and female, they are at different location. So male is more distal, female is more proximal, but you can do direct recording. So if you look at the picture on the left side, it's a, it's a printed uh, electrode. And on the right side, this is plugged into the patient and they have a bipolar electrode and uh, we can just plug into that amplifier box as uh, an odon cathode. So the, in this image, you can think we're running continuously MEP. So you can see, if, um, with the minimal patient movement. So when you're doing MEP, so it's very critical to make sure you're placing the uh, electrode for stimulation at the cortex after measuring the head. And so with the minimum patient movement and have accurate parameters. So we have like every 30 seconds, so we are stimulating MEP from 30 seconds. But this is, we are comparing the left sphincter with the right sphincter and the urethral electrode MEP. So we have very good, robust, repeatable and reliable MEP during the surgical procedure. Another patient, we have um, on the left side and right side, so left MEP and right MEP, comparing left foot, left anal sphincter, and right foot to the external unit sphincter MEP. So for result for this, this study we did, we had 14 patients had a good motor responses. So the success rate for this one out of 15 patients, we have 93% patient, we have good MEP, only one patient we were not able to record. Uh, TCP for anal sphincter was not recorded in one patient and it was poor in two patients and reliable in two patients and was not, was not recording on one patient. The amplitude of MEP was much higher for the urethral electrode uh, compared to anal sphincter in this study. So, so the next modality we are going to talk about is uh, we can add to the surgical procedure is spontaneous EMG. So electromagnetic is the same electrode can be used for EM, EMG, uh, same EMG that we are using for motor evoke potential. And so again, it's a part of the multimodality monitoring. So you can do trigger EMG and, and uh, uh, motor evoke potential from this uh, same electrode. So we did a retrospective analysis of IM data from, um, for, for, from patient. We have seven intradural tumors, three tethered cord release surgeries that use these uh, electrodes and we recorded it in two different medical centers. The age of the patient, we have five male and five female. And the youngest patient we had was eight month old and the oldest person was 67 years old. So this, um, so there are different patients. So we are, <coughs> sorry. So for the 47, so different, we use different catheter size. So we just, uh, so we have conus tumors, laminectomy and record patient. So the eight month old, we use eight franc, which is, size typically used for uh, about one year old or patient. So we use eight, for eight franc for these patients. And then the six year old, eight year olds, we have 10 franc and then we have 18 years old. So depending on the age of the patient and the uh, sex of the patient, we use different size of the, uh, the catheter electrode for regarding EMG. So when we are doing, um, so the another interesting thing is when we are doing MEP and EMG, 
So beside recording and stimulation therapy meters, it also very, very critical to know what type of electrode you are using for muscle recording. So again, this is another study published where we compared the success rate of 13 millimeter to the longer needle electrode. And on the right side, you can see this is one of the patient where uh, we took the x-ray after the surgery and you can see the 15, 50 millimeter electrode was close to the muscles uh, near the femur compared to 37, 25 and other electrode. So this is one of the patient. So for the longer needle, you can put the tegaderm or put the tape on that, but it, they were very, very secure and even without putting the electrode, but 30 millimeter was very small. So these are very uh, important for the patient who have high uh, BMI. So the patient very obese and, and uh, the diameter of the, the, muscle, the muscle is very, very deep in the adipose tissue. So you have to use the electrode, longer electrode to record that. So in this patient, you can see, we use 13 and 18, but if, uh, so it was a no, no response in 13 and 18 millimeter, and we have very small response, about 150 microvolt in 25 and 37 micro, uh, millimeter uh, electrode, we have about 700 microvolt response. So it's a huge response. And if you have used only 13 millimeter, we had uh, no response in this muscle. And this is the recording from erectus femoris muscle for quadriceps. So 100% success rate for these, the patients we did uh, in our study. So these are the responses. So comparing the left foot muscle, left sphincter muscle, and the right side. So the blue area is the left uh, and the sphincter response from the left side and the right side. So when you're doing modality, so we have multi-modality again. So the next modality, I'm just going to go briefly is the uh, autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system is also known as visceral system because the autonomic nervous system supplies the, all the visceral uh, tissue, uh, organs of the of the of the body. So it's also known as uh, visceral nervous system. So uh, it is uh, neuronal neuronal groups and fibers that are connect uh, connections that control the activity of visceral organs and the blood vessels and the gland. It is divided into sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic system. So in another talk, we can go in much detail, but today just giving you a summary. So the sympathetic nervous system, the, uh, both system have preganglionic nuclei and the postganglionic nuclei. So the length of the pre, uh, the prime pre of the first neuron is a uh, different. So the both length of the neuron are different in sympathetic versus parasympathetic. So the pre ganglionic neurons for synthetic are at level of thoracic one vertebra to L2 segment. They release norepinephrine and they act in bowel and bladder. And uh, when they act beside the vessels and the gland in bowel, they cause smooth muscle uh, relaxation and bladder, it causes uh, detrusal, which is another smooth muscle of the bladder wall relaxation. Activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, which originate from S2 and S4 segment, release acetylcholine, and it causes bowel and bladder contraction by acting on the same muscle. <clears throat> so the main difference between sympathetic nervous system activation and parasympathetic activation is relaxation versus contraction of bowel and bladder muscle. Multimodality monitoring of autonomic nerves of pelvic with internal anal sphincter EMG and the urinary bladder uh, manometry has been used in advanced nerve sparing surgeries to improve functional outcome. Uh, Koff et al. also uh, published that initial results suggest that IUM may result in lower rates of urinary and anorectal dysfunction and may predict male erectile dysfunction by monitoring. Uh, so monitoring of autonomic no, no pelvic nerves can be performed during robotic assisted low anterior rectal resection. So, so during the surgical procedures involving colorectal surgeries, uh, bladders, uh, bladder surgeries, prostate surgeries, um, having uh, EMG, MEP, and uh, bladder pressure monitoring can maximize the post-operative uh, benefit. In other studies by Partner et al. reported severe sexual dysfunction in 35% male after quad injury. So this is, so then monitoring these uh, patients can help. Um, a study by Passover uh, to have a variety of genital urinary disorders in women undergoing radical pelvic surgery. And uh, 30, in other study, 30% risk of importance in men with most favorable preoperative radical prostatectomy. And these 
another study reported fecal incontinence and urinary sexual dysfunction after colorectal surgery. So the different type of surgeries involving these areas, they can have significant post-operative deficit, which range from as high as 30, 35%. So again, uh, going back to the potential nerve, it derives from the ventral rami of S1, S, uh, S2, S3, S, sorry, S2, S3, and S4 roots sometimes get the S1. It's a, um, it continues through the gas, uh, greater sciatic foramen and enters the lateral direction into the uh, ischiorectal fossa. It's uh, muscular branches innervate the external anal sphincter and the external urethral sphincter. So we can, if you, Put the electrode in those two sphincter we can monitor those two also the muscular branches of the muscular levator ni muscle uh, we can be monitored okay, is supplied by the potential nerve so uh, so the hyper, if you're looking at the top bottom uh, uh, picture on autonomic nervous system so yeah this the, the synthetic fibers they start from um, very high uh, from the brain stem and they come all down to the sacral area and you have um, the supplying rectum, bladder and the prostate in the in the pelvic area. So the key, uh, key factor for doing all of that is um, it reduces the risk of post-operative neurological deficit by providing consistent standard of care of patient uh, monitor the neural structure at risk during these type of surgical procedure and the different modalities we discussed. So we can add potential SSCP, we can add uh, bulbar cavernous reflex, we can add EMG, motor evoke potential, and uh, blood pressure monitoring for, for various type of surgery, uh, not only just the, the neurosurgery or also some, some type of spine surgery involving the the sacral area and also a gynecological procedure, uh, urological surgical procedure and uh, general surgical procedure. So we are doing monitoring and having multi-modality defect when we can give the surgeon an immediate feedback about different and give them. So there are different uh, papers. So if you want to reach out to me and I can send you the link for different paper, surgical papers. Uh, which shows the benefit of monitoring in these surgical procedures. Thank you. So we um, we ask that you continue to uh, submit your questions, um, and thank you to the people who are submitting questions. Um, uh, we are going to save those questions for our question and answer period at the end. Hi guys, how are you doing today? Um, all right, so I am going to go ahead and give you guys an overview also um, of the technical setup and recordings and then go over some patient data of the modalities uh, that Faisal just mentioned uh, previously. So no conflicts of interest on my end. And just to give you guys a setup of exactly how we're going to go through everything, we'll first discuss the technical setups, um, do a quick pathway review, uh, go over the anesthetic conditions, the unique supplies, the patient setup, show you guys the protocol and settings for recording and stimulation, and then some morphology and the components of the waveforms. And then if there's time, we'll also go through two case studies, one of which is an intramedullary spinal cord tumor resection, and then a pediatric tethered cord release. Um, so two techniques that we employ, which you guys, if you're already doing intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring, you know um, there are two main things that we accomplish in the OR, both monitoring, which is going to encompass your somatosensory evoke potentials, motor evoke potentials, spontaneous EMG, and then the BCR um, to identify changes in the nervous system functioning, hopefully always prior to any irreversible damage. And then also mapping, where we're looking at uh, triggered EMG or nerve conduction to identify neurological structure um, and uh, physiological changes that might be um, occurring in the surgery to distinguish functional tissue from non-functional tissue. 
So the three main modalities we'll go over today, the reflex, the bulbocavernosus reflex, pedendal SSCPs, um, which are going to be a little bit different for stimulation of the dorsal nerve on males versus females. And then um, grouped together, we'll, we'll discuss uh, motor book potentials, transcranial electrical motor book potentials, and electromyography um, from the external urethral sphincter. I won't go into too much detail about the anal sphincter, uh, as this one's pretty uh, pretty well covered, I think, at this point, but I will have some pictures and examples as well. So we'll start with the reflexes, the bulbocavernosus reflex, also known as the bulbospongiosis reflex, BSR, um, or pedendal anal reflex. And we have our first poll question. Um, so do you guys feel comfortable explaining to someone what, a re what information a reflex response gives us intraoperatively? And we'll come back to that at the end of this section. I need to get this question out of my way. <laughs> okay, so let's just do a quick reflex review. Help you guys answer that question a little bit. Um, so the function of any reflex is to maintain homeostasis in the body. And a reflex arc is the simplest nerve pathway in the body and it involves the sensory and motor neuron at minimum. There are two types. We have somatic and autonomic or visceral. Um, so the components of the bulbocavernosus reflex arc, um, first we have our sensory receptor and the neuron, which I'm going to group just because specifically for this, uh, we, we are bypassing the sensory receptor since we are stimulating um, directly, but there's a response to the stimuli and that sends an action potential and propagates that action potential to the central nervous system. And for the BCR specifically, that is the dorsal nerve of the clitoris or penis, and that propagates to the pedendal nerve. Once it reaches the conus, oh, there, I'm trying to find this, um, it will uh, connect with an interneuron, and then that passes the signal off uh, from the sensory uh, to the motor neurons via synapses in the central nervous system. So specifically for the BCR, you have a group of pedendal motor neurons in the conus known as onus nucleus, and that's located in the ventral gray near the distal tip of the conus medullaris. And that sends another signal back down the chain um, via the motor neuron to an effector muscle. And that causes a contraction. Um, so traveling back down the S2 to 4 spinal cord segments, and uh, we get a contraction of the bulbocavernosus or bulbospongiosis, which is highlighted in red in the pictures to the right on the female in the top picture and the male in the bottom picture. Um, the reason why uh, it's called the bulbocavernosus is because that's um, the muscle that that contracts. However, the anal sphincter uh, contracts as well and uh, is known as an anal wink. And so we are able to record from that uh, a little bit more easily than from the bulbocavernosus itself. So anesthetic considerations, I think this was one of the, the questions on the last presentation. Um, anesthesia for bulbocavernosus reflex, since there is uh, the motor pathway involved, we have to have a train of 404 um, and highly recommended to use a, a TIVA regimen with uh, propofol and a narcotic induction if possible. Uh, maintain an adequate map for the patient. And the contraindications really are, are gas. So um, it is an oligosynaptic pathway. There's multiple synapses. And so gas causes a significant attenuation or loss of the signal. And this is from a study in 1997 of Deletus. And they started the case with gas, everything off, got a beautiful response and then turned on isoflurane to 1.25% to see how it would affect the signal. And you can see a huge decrease in the size of the response. Um, and then after the response had you know, it started decaying, they turned the gas back off and it still took about 30 minutes later for the response to recover from um, the deterioration that had occurred from the gas. So ideally, you really do want to go with a TIVA regimen to be able to monitor these reliably in your surgeries. So the supplies that we use 
um, recommended a 19 to 25 millimeter paired needle electrode for recording. Um, and then a seven to 13 millimeter paired needle electrodes or surface electrodes for stimulating. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about uh, the difference between using a paired needle versus a surface electrode for these in a moment. Um, and then really just the biggest no-no is to avoid insulated electrodes. So uh, because uh, the anatomy of the anal sphincter um, would, it is it, you want the entire needle to be collecting or recording rather than just like a small tip of it that could have already that could pierce through or might not be exactly in the area you want to record. So you want to have a really large surface area for recording. Um, the patient setup for stimulation, um, we recommend the use of short bare needles. Um, you can use surface electrodes, um, but we'll go into a little bit more detail, like I said, in a minute. Uh, there's a better chance of getting the early ipsilateral responses independently uh, if you use needles as opposed to the surface electrodes. And for males, there are two options. Um, you can do a unilateral stimulation by placing the cathode on the dorsum of the penis and then the anode at the distal penal shaft. Or you can do a bilateral recording. Um, and again, kind of two options here for the bilateral uh, stimulation. You can place the cathodes implanted on either side of the proximal infrapubic penis with the anode far lateral penile shaft. Um, or um, in 2017, Dr. Skinner did a really wonderful webinar um, where he described the use of uh, needles placed at the shaft of the penis below the pubic bone with two cathodes in the center and two outside from them. And I'll show you guys how that setup looks and recording. So for unilateral stimulation, um, just placing it there on the dorsum for the dorsal nerve, your cathode and anode. And then for the bilateral stimulation, you can place the needles at the top with the anodes on the outside of your cathodes. So just the entire, the entire pathway from stimulation to recording, um, plugging into your anodes and cathodes and just note from this picture, of course, the stimulation would occur on the dorsal side or um, in the picture that I showed previously with needles um, at the top of the shaft um, stimulating and that travels up the nerve roots into the conus. We have the interneuron carrying that signal to onus nucleus. That response travels back down and out and then causes um, the reflex in the anal sphincter, which we then record. So this is the complete pathway with the setup. So for females, um, just a little bit different, obviously, as the anatomy is different. So you can do a unilateral stimulation, placing the cathode on the proximal infrapubic clitoris, and then the anode on the labia majorum on either side. Or for a bilateral stimulation, um, you can actually place two cathodes at the clitoris, which is very small real estate, but still possible. And then one anode on each labia majorum. So this is what a bilateral stimulation setup would look like. So again, uh, just kind of easier with the real estate to utilize a very small needle. Um, also uh, just able to secure them a little bit more easily is that the skin on that area can sometimes be difficult to place surface electrodes that will actually, um, that will stay in place. And then we'll go through the full patient setup. So you got your stimulator, your anode and cathode there on the labia majorum and the clitoris. Same exact thing, travels up, um, travels up the nerves. And we have the interneuron carrying the signal to onus nucleus, travels back down, causes that contraction in the anal sphincter that we're able to record. So just a few notes on independent stimulation on each side. Um, the cool thing about it is it does permit a higher possibility of monitoring um, the early ipsilateral responses independently on the left and the right. Um, but just uh, know that by reason of proximity, of course, of the dorsal ner nerves to each other on each side, um, as they course infrapubically, there is a very restricted ipsilateral stimulation to be obtained. So it's, it's definitely um, uncommon and shouldn't be expected. 
Um, so for your recordings, um, you'll use 19 to 25 millimeter non-insulated, as we discussed, needle electrodes placed through the glabrous non-keratinized skin of the anal verge. Um, Dr. Skinner recommends a 22 millimeter um, depth elect uh, for your electrodes. And so you can kind of see from these pictures um, just how centralized and how deep uh, the muscle is. And so it's important to use a needle that's long enough. So if you're using like a 13 millimeter, there's a chance that you're missing some of the recording um, just by, by uh, the lack of the needle not getting deep enough. It should pierce the subcutaneous component of the external anal sphincter. And that, that's the part that's highlighted in green in the pictures to the right. And then um, it's recommended to use two electrodes per hemisphincter, about one or so centimeters apart from each other. And the reason why we do take a bilateral recording, even though it's a funnel-shaped muscle that's relatively circular, it is still innervated separately on both the left and the right. So it's best to take a recording from both sides if, if you can manage, uh, manage that. So just a few technique tips um, from, from the setup end. Um, apply tape liberally to secure. Um, in one report out of uh, 100 cases that BCR was performed, six of them had an unobtainable BCR. And they actually found that four out of those six, the reason why they were unattainable was because the electrodes had become dislodged. Um, and again, that kind of feeds into the reason why, since these patients are asleep and um, it's not painful to place needles, it's best to place the electrodes as needles so that they are, are easier to keep in place. Um, and, and like I said, there's some smaller real estate down there. So uh, making sure that you can get the most optimal responses. And if that means having a bilateral stim and a bilateral recording, that's, that can be your best bet as a backup. Um, and then for posterior spinal surgeries, you can place your stimu stimulating electrodes before the patient's positioned and then place the recording after so you don't have to worry about anything coming up. And like I said, don't be afraid um, if you're doing these intraoperatively. Of course, um, a lot of the papers that's published on all of this has been done in the clinic. So they're using uh, different kinds of surface electrodes. Um, but again, uh, we regularly do use needles in our practice um, as it is, uh, makes for easier recording and, and more secure placement. So uh, BCR protocols and settings. So you have options here. Um, you'll wanna use a constant current stimulation. So you really can choose what mode you want to set it up with depending on what kind of equipment you're using. Um, the pictures I have below are set up with uh, motor evoke potential mode just um, for ease. And I can provide these photos if anyone's interested after the webinar. But your stimulation parameters, five to 50 milliamps, pulse count of about four to five. A duration is going to be higher than you typically would use for your uh, posterior tibial nerve or other SSCPs of uh, 500 microseconds and then an ISI of three milliseconds or 333 hertz if that is what your machine is set to. Um, a double train stimulation, if you're having trouble getting your, uh, your responses with those values is, is definitely the next step to try. It can definitely enhance the response. Um, but you do have to keep in mind by uh, doing a double train stimulation that you'll need to increase your time base then and uh, configure the second train identically with the same ISI and stim intensity as you have for your first train. So you can divide your pulse counts up two and then three and then do an intertrain interval which can vary, um, maybe start somewhere between 150 to 200. Uh, which is typical, and then you can try varying that from somewhere between 75 to 250 to see if that helps obtain the response. So your recording parameters, um, very simple, whatever you set your EMG to normally. The display sweep, uh, 200 milliseconds is a typical place to start. However, I would say these can vary based on age and pre-existing pathology greatly. So you have to be prepared to troubleshoot, be prepared, um, to be looking for a, a later response if you aren't getting or seeing it on your screen. 
And same with the sensitivity. So you could have an enormous response that's jumping off the page um, and you need to scroll down or you could have a response that's so small that you need to, to increase that. So I have two examples here. On the left, you can see this is a pediatric patient and we have a 100 millisecond sweep on this one and it's a very large amplitude response. Um, versus the one on the right, which is an older patient with pre-existing pathology. And so we have a 500 millisecond sweep, much, much longer, and then a, uh, a, a lot smaller response. So again, this is all going to be dependent on your patient. Uh, the acquisition frequency, this is probably one of the biggest benefits to running the BCR recordings, um, is that they don't typically interfere with the surgery, and you are able to record them very often. So you can run them almost continuously, especially during risky surgical maneuvers. Um, the great thing is these are recording, these are monitoring both sensory and motor pathways. So it's a really, really great alternative um, to switching back and forth between running your motor evoke potentials and your sensory evoke potentials. And you can also set up recurrent stimulation. Let's go through really quick um, the morphology and components of the waveform. So uh, as was already meant mentioned, there's both an early and a late response on these. And the R1 response is uh, going to fall usually somewhere around 30 to 35 milliseconds in adults. Um, however, that last slide I showed you that that patients didn't early response came in, actually, I think it was closer to 80 or 90 milliseconds. Um, the R1 response does not habituate. Uh, so constant stimulation is not going to decrease the size of this response. I think I saw that pop up, somebody asking if your pedendal SSCP stimulation would affect your ability to collect a BCR response. Um, it is the shortest pathway response, obviously, it comes in first, and it's oligosynaptic, which means it's interrupted only by a few synaptic junctions. Um, so more than one, um, but less than poly. And the R2, the late response, is polysynaptic. So you're going to see that more affected by your anesthesia um, and might be a little bit harder to collect a good response from in the OR. Uh, the number of neurons fired is going to correlate roughly to the complexity of the BCR response. So some things to keep in mind for troubleshooting, if you're getting blunted signals, um, you might need to use longer length needles for recording from the anal sphincter. If you're having a significant stimulus artifact, um, some things you can do to remedy that would be to increase your dynamic range, um, switch to biphasic stimulation. You can move your anode and your cathode closer together uh, and if you're using surface electrodes, make sure you've really prepped your stimulation site well prior to placing the electrodes. Um, or like I mentioned, alternatively use needles instead of adhesives. If you're just getting no response at all and it's just completely flat, uh, you definitely want to check your stimulating electrodes for connectivity. And again, another reason why it's great to do that bilateral stimulation so that you have two options, uh, two options to use for your stimulation. Great for troubleshooting. Um, increase the intensity would be the first step. Maybe it's just taking a little bit more to get those uh, to, to depolarize. And then the last step would be to switch to the double train stimulus. So some troubleshooting tactics for unique patients. Um, patients with neuropathy at the conus are going to probably require higher levels of current and longer duration of stimuli. So you might increase those. Um, patients with upper motor neuron disease uh, might experience what's called a disinhibited BCR or uh, anticipated released response. So these patients are going to have a really low stimulation requirement, not a, a high intensity to evoke a response, and there might be also a prolonged discharge. Pediatric patients, um, a really another great paper by Huang in 2017, um, recommends for infants less than 24 months that you use a biphasic eight pulse count stimulation with two millisecond intervals. It's just something to keep in your tool, tool bag if you're working on some of the younger population. So alert criteria, um, of course, disappearance, complete disappearance, especially when it's linked to a risky surgical context. Um, and then 
how we were talking about the number of neurons fired correlates with the complexity of the waveform. If your waveform starts diminishing in complexity, as in the, the duration or the turn count, this could be a forewarning that a disappearance is imminent, or it could indicate um, that there's an incomplete degree of conduction block. So there could be something in the system that's that's blocking the signal from getting through, um, but not completely. So it's an, it's a, an opportunity to to bring this up to discuss and figure out if there's anything that can be done to prevent a disappearance and to allow the response to return. Um, so there are a few disadvantages to running um, BCRs. The gas and muscle relaxants are absolute contra contraindications, which makes it uh, difficult if you are working with an anesthetic team that is not super into uh, helping you obtain the best responses. And they also require a high level of skill for correct setup and troubleshooting. There are far more advantages um, that outweigh the disadvantages for this modality. It can be run continuously and often. Um, it doesn't cause a lot of patient movement, so it, it's fantastic as far as being able to run it constantly. Um, it, it doesn't require any averaging to be done. And it's an evoke potential, and it can detect stretch injury, which is it's superior to just running um, spontaneous EMG. It has a very specific target, right? So we're not going all the way up to the brain like we are with our motor book potentials and somatosensory three book potentials. Um, so if you're interested in, in monitoring the sacral uh, system, very specific target. And it simultaneously monitors both sensory and motor components peripherally and at the segmental level. So fantastic modality. It's very robust and reliable and it can be tested often, the three most important criteria. Um, so let's revisit the poll. Do you feel comfortable explaining to someone what information I found this on the web. a reflex response gives? And just a couple of my favorite quotes uh, from some papers on this uh, that just go over the anatomy and, and what, what information this response does give us. Oh, it's not letting me. Oh, there we go. Um, and uh, one of my favorites, how to describe a BCR alert. A conduction block has developed within one or more constituents of the somatic low sacral reflex arc. And if you're wondering what, again, if my webinar is going too fast for you and not sure what the somatic low sacral reflex arc is, the two quotes above give a really great, uh, great description of what that encompasses. So pedendal SSCPs. Um, true or false, if you are monitoring posterior tibial nerve SSCPs and bulbar cavernosus reflex responses, there is no additional patient setup to monitor pedendal SSCPs. Go ahead and send in your responses. And we'll start doing a little review of the pathway. So the components, um, stimulation, follows the nerve, up the nerve roots, through the spinal cord and recording from sensory cortex. Um, as was already mentioned in the previous webinar, or previous presentation, the best recording site found by Haldeman was CPZ. And um, the uh, medial aspect of the cortex deep in the interhemispheric fissure is actually where uh, these, the sensory um, components for these lie. So that is why that is the closest location we can actually get, as you can see from the picture. So anesthetic considerations, um, really the same as you would for any SSCP. The supplies, you could use a seven to 13 millimeter paired needle electrodes or the surface electrodes for stimulating. And then of course your head leads for recording. So let's revisit the poll. Um, this is a true statement. If you're running your posterior tibial nerve SSCPs and your BCRs, there's nothing else that you need to set up as far as the patient goes. So same stimulation as BCR, same recording as your PTNs from CPZ to FPZ. And here's the picture from Haldeman. You can see the CPZ recording is just much more robust of a response. So protocols and settings, the main difference you're going to see um, with this is just to start your pulse width a little bit lower um, than you would, but you might need to increase that back up. 
and then your recording parameters, also whatever you would normally set your posterior tibial SSCPs to. And same for the display. Um, you can use a sweep of 100 milliseconds or more. And a, a sensitivity, it might be a little bit or a smaller response. You might need to increase the size a little bit. Um, unfortunately, it does take time to average, just like your typical SSCP. So the acquisition frequency is not going to be as often as for your BCR, and you can run intermittently rotating through other tests. So the waveform um, clinically presents in this W shape with four points, P1, N1, P2, and N2. Um, and in, intraoperably, uh, as was mentioned, very similar in, in context to the posterior tibial nerve. Um, one of the questions that we, we saw was asked was about pedendal neuropathy. I don't really have time to touch on this much, but there's a couple good papers on this. These are clinical um, papers that uh, use patients positioning to describe different sorts of entrapment that can happen. And it's important to note that the pedendal nerve splits into three peripheral nerves. And if you're anal, perineal, and and dorsal nerve, which is the one we're stimulating. So it, for example, if there were to be entrapment in Alcox canal, uh, which the dorsal nerve does not travel through, um, stimulation of the dorsal nerve could, could miss that, that entrapment. And this is another paper where a perineal nerve SSCP was elicited. All right, and then external urethral sphincter, EMG, and motor evoke potentials. Uh, do you feel that adding uh, this monitoring to your current setup would be technically challenging. Quick review. Um, I think uh, Faisal covered this fantastically, so I'm going to skip through it so we have time to get to two case studies. Uh, anesthetics, same exact scenario as you do for your limb. Um, evoke potentials. The supplies, it's a catheter with gold electrodes that comes in varying sizes. Um, I prefer to use that link quadrupolar motor uh, uh, stimulation for my motor evoke potentials just to get a good, um, a good uh, variety of stimulation sites. And uh, we, we do use the corkscrew electrodes uh, for a larger surface area of stimulation. So let's revisit the poll. Do you feel that adding the sphincter monitoring would be technically challenging? Um, well, the nurse is uh, coming to your rescue. So uh, she's the one who will place the Foley catheter in the patient. Um, so for you, no, not really. Although um, if you have a, a difficulty of not having the correct size for the patient, then that is where things can get hairy. So as was mentioned previously, making sure that you know what size is needed by your surgical team for that particular patient is going to be the most technically challenging part of the setup for you. Just some pictures, beautiful, beautiful model um, made for me by Brett. A little bit wonky looking because I've inflated this balloon so many times to, to show our interns, um, but just the way that the electrode sits in the bladder and is used to record. And the the recording site is nice and long because the location of the external anal, uh, external urethral sphincter on females versus males is different. So you don't need to get a different type of catheter uh, for males versus females. All of these catheters will work for either sex. Um, the, the most important thing is just to know what size you need. So here's just kind of our troubleshooting algorithm that we use for stimulation um, uh, of our lower motor evoke potentials. But really, uh, it's, it's going to be the same recording and stimulation parameters that you would use for your motor evoke potentials and EMG of the lower extremities. So I got just some different pictures that kind of show you uh, the different morphologies that you might see in patients of the urinary sphincter and the anal sphincter uh, in surgery. And uh, one of the other questions that came up was what's the approximate, uh, let's see, the approximate latency. So I would say on average, it's going to come in before 30 milliseconds. And again, this can really vary from patient to patient, but you can see from these pictures, it's, it is typically going to be coming in very, very close in line with the anal sphincter. And the response can, can vary uh, pretty distinctly. So in these ones, it's looking a little bit more blunted. Um, again, 
than uh, some of the other ones that are a little bit more crisp. And sometimes the response is like in this, in this scenario, a little bit small. Um, sometimes it's very robust. So case study number one, we'll, we're going to have to go through this pretty quick, um, but uh, have you ever monitored the pelvic floor in any fashion for an intramedullary spinal cord tumor at the conus? All right, so we have an example case. Um, T10 to L2, 75-year-old male. He had progressive lower extremity weakness, pain, bowel and bladder control issues. Um, and primary tumors of the spinal cord, which you can see in the scans to the left. Um, we did a TIVA anesthesia, um, kept the map up, and no muscle relaxant was on board by monitoring start. The two um, modalities we're going to focus in on for this are the BCR and the urethral sphincter TEMG that were um, critical in the uh, development of this case. So here's the setup. We did the urethral sphincter recordings um, and then the setup uh, right in that infrapubic location with the double stimulation for our best chance of obtaining reliable signals. Uh, we also did place the surface electrodes on the dorsum of the penis as a very uh, as a backup. So really had three stimulation sites and used lots and lots of tape as you can see and here is the Foley catheter coming out. Here is our baseline data, nice, beautiful, robust responses from the bulbocavernosis reflex. And our uh, motor evoke potentials had a little bit more difficulty obtaining the responses from the um, anal sphincter and the urethral sphincter. So we were grateful to have a BCR response. Um, after the surgeon got down to the level of the conus and, and uh, open the dura, we went ahead and stimulated. And at multiple times, we got responses from the urethral sphincter and from the anal sphincter and, and not from any other, any other parts, uh, muscles that were being monitored. So it was really crucial that we had these electrodes in place to be able to identify these, uh, these systems that were not being monitored by the lower extremities. So sometimes we get responses from the foot or the gastroc or other muscles. Um, and at one point then we started getting some significant spontaneous EMG activity during all the manipulation. So we ran our BCR and saw that it was lost. Um, so the surgeon took a surgical pause, um, removed everything from the field, and we continued to collect BCR continuously as those, as we mentioned, they, they do not habituate with stimulation. Um, and nine minutes later, uh, the right side returned and the surgeon resumed the surgery. We did some more uh, triggered EMG mapping um, and he was able to take a limited biopsy and resect small fragments to send to pathology. Uh, but the mapping was critical, um, was critical to uh, letting him know because what he would have taken a large chunk of thinking it was tumor actually turned out to be parts of the conus. And at this point we had again on the left another loss of the BCR. The surgeon did the same thing. He took a, a surgical pause and this time it returned within three minutes. Um, in conclusion, the patient's bowel and bladder function was preserved and they were actually discharged to rehab two days after. Um, the surgical pauses with the loss of the BCR, we believe, could have aided in preventing dysfunction. And triggered EMG mapping of both urethral and anal sphincter helped him avoid removing any motor structures. So some critical lessons. Don't rotate through other tests during critical parts. Keep running the BCR continuously. Um, if it disappears during dissection, um, the surgeon should stop. Laser and cautery can send discharges um, that heat the cord, um, and a tight suture can also place a lot of pressure on the contents of the conus, so that can uh, potentially be another cause after the fact. Um, important to always be recording the context and staying uh, in good communication with the surgical team so that you can report context-driven events. And remember that pedendal neurons are built to fire, so they don't habituate from activating them too often as other systems do, so check continuously. 
Um, it's also possible to see a BCR change with a stable uh, anal sphincter or urethral sphincter motor evoke potential. Um, the approach for, for this procedure is posterior towards the afferent part of the cord. Um, and the afferent nerve roots. So only measuring efferent pathways, you could miss information. So that's another reason why it's so helpful. Um, the pedendal SZPs in this case weren't obtained. They're, they can be tricky to obtain. And I think we're gonna just kind of cut this one um, a little bit short since we're running out of time, but what's the youngest patient you think should be monitored for pelvic floor function intraoperatively? All right. So according to the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, by five years of age, over 90% of children have daytime bladder control. Um, however, right, just because uh, the patient has control of their bladder uh, by, before that age, it uh, doesn't mean that they don't still have function, even if they don't know how to use that function, right? So. Um, ideally, we want to be able to monitor them as young as possible. And motor evoke potential recordings have been published in, in a baby at 15 days of life. Um, not, this isn't pelvic floor, but just um, from the limbs. I'm going to show you guys some pictures of pelvic floor monitoring in a six-month-old patient that I recorded. Beautiful BCR responses. Gorgeous um, trigger DMG urethral sphincter um, responses on from this patient using the smallest catheter size. So it's, it, it, this part becomes dependent on if it's able to be placed, if the electrode is able to be placed. Um, but we were able to adequately monitor this patient for a tethered cord release, the six month old patient, and get beautiful pelvic floor responses. Um, and we're just gonna go ahead and skip through this one, but this is a six year old patient. Get to the end. Um, and again, had a beautiful motor evoke potential responses, um, great anal sphincter responses, reliable BCR responses. Um, and they were able to isolate the phylum, test it 360 degrees around, keep running BCR during the untethering, just in case there was anything we were missing during the triggered EMG. And when the phylum was released, everything stayed stable as far as our motor evoke potentials. Um, and our uh, bulbal cavernosis reflex. Um, so in conclusion, you should add your pelvic floor monitoring to your practice. Uh, the tools are very powerful and, and there's a great uh, availability of modalities to be run. Thank you, um, Katie and Faisal uh, for very nice presentations. Um, there's so much to talk about. We do have, uh, many questions that have been um, submitted and some have been um, have been answered in the sake of keeping everyone on the same page. Perhaps we should take one question at a time and um, uh, and, and and go over it. Uh, one of our um, let's let's just take this uh, from Dr. Pace, Chris Pace. Um, do do you find that running pedendal SSCPs impacts your ability to evoke BCR? And Katie, you alluded to this. Um, and uh, uh, Faisal or Katie, do you would you like to uh, address this to touch? Um, thank you. That's a nice question. Very good question. Um, the only thing is when we are running the BCR and pedendal SSCP, so we are doing intermittently. So they're not going to affect each other. The one thing that can come up from this question is we have tried and recorded pudendal SSCP from recording the bladder electrode. So pudendal SSCP can be done as uh, um, presented in the second lecture that by placement of the surface electrode or needle electrode in the genital area, but uh, you can also try using the bladder electrode, you can stimulate the, the potential nerve and record for them. The, um, the success of that is not as high right now because we are, it's a just a new thing and we are still trying and collecting the data. Uh, one thing we are trying to see is the difference between stimulating bipolarly, bipolarly 
inside the bladder comparing to using one electrode on the bladder electrode and one on the external electrode. Uh, Katie, did you have anything because you had mentioned this in your? Uh, I think just, you know, uh, you can't obviously can't run them at the same time or should not run them at the same time. But uh, I think, you know, as mentioned that uh, the BCR responses, the pedendal motor neuro uh, neurons are, are built to fire. Um, and so you don't have to worry if that's that the concern about a habituation of the signal um, from overstimulation. Okay, so next question. Um, I see uh, John Paul Sumaquero, uh, always nice to see you, um, asks, uh, literature is not consistent with running MEPs on tethered cord. Most lit suggests that triggered EMG and spontaneous EMG are sufficient. How would you educate a surgeon? How do you go about talking to your surgeons on the utility of adding MEPs to the procedure? Uh, Dr. Sala and his group advocate running MEPs, but Newer's text doesn't. Thoughts? So running the MEP is again controversial for tethered cord. So we still have both sides of the authors like they're saying just triggered EMG is enough and MEP. But one thing that we are trying to add here is most of the patients, a, a big number of patients in these cases, cases, they can wake up with a urogenic bladder. So, so when we are uh, running MEP, uh, when you're talking about these papers, they are talking about the the muscle MEP from the lower extremity or uh, anal sphincter. So if you're doing MEP from anal sphincter, then you can focus primarily on pudendal nerve, but most the higher risk is the urogenital, uh, uh, urogenic bladder. So if you have a patient where the uh, it's not a simple tethered cord, it has a, a meningocele or myomeningocele or uh, any extra tumor, uh, and you have a risk of having a urogenic bladder postoperatively, then the only way you can prevent that, not 100%, but you can add another modality, is using MEP from the bladder muscle, uh, external urinary sphincter muscles. And we can do MEP and trigger MG for identification and MEP for continuously running to make sure the pathway is intact. Um, hmm. uh, Katie, no. I think that's great. <laughs> um, okay, so the next question I think has been um, has been discussed a good bit here. Would it be possible to do BCR and um, external urinary sphincter as well? And I think that that has been answered. Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, again, the BCR. Uh, so you can use the ex the same blood electrode. So you can do blood BCR by surface electrode as. Uh, Catherine said that, uh, but you can, you have two options now. You can do the surface BCR and you can use the bladder BCR uh, because it's less, it's the last few years we are doing that. So it's, the data is still not enough. So once we have enough data, we have like hundreds of cases, then we can publish that data. But, but it's, so the main, uh, one of the purpose of this presentation is not to give you a decisive answer. But, or decisive um, material, but it is in, uh, inciting a seed for the thought. So you start going back and think that there's something else you can do in these surgeries. And you are well, and, and I'm challenging you and I'm inviting everyone to collect the data and publish the data. And hopefully we can combine the data and have a very good outcome. So one thing you can do is do your own testing, run BCR uh, from the internal uh, electrode and surface electrode and see the comparison. So you can do BCR and put an LSSB from surface and internal electrodes. Which uh, um, I, it makes me think of another question that my friend, uh, Dr. Wurzbowski has asked. Yeah. Um, he asks, um, since pelvic floor anatomy and neurophysiology have many unknowns, have either of you tried recording from the external urinary sphincter with urethral catheter electrodes to BCR stimulation? And in Faisal, you would answer this question, but yeah. I, I would love to uh, hear a little bit more about it. Yeah, thank you, Larry. So the reason we haven't tried that, the reason because your BCR stimulation and external uh, urinary sphincter that they're so close. So the only thing is we have done is we have tried to stimulating from external urinary sphincter and recording from the in, internal anal sphincter muscles. Be very, so uh, 
yes. So you so, you have tried or? So we have tried. Uh, the success is not very high, but we have tried. So because every patient is different, uh, so we are not still. Every time we are trying, we have a different patient, different pathology, and different catheter side. So it's very hard to have one catheter size and comparing to the other catheter side. But uh, we have tried st comparing the stimulation from the external unit sphincter and surface electrode doing the BCR and the recording from internal unit sphincter. And that's a possibility. So it's not, it's not a zero. Um, forgive, uh, I hope everyone yeah. for, forgive me for throwing in a question that I have had that did come up a couple of times. When we look at the innervation of the entire pelvic floor, um, including the rhabdo sphincters, whether, whether it's the anal sphincter or the urethral sphincter, um, everything is um, fired in synchrony, whether it's somatic, whether it is parasympathetic, whether it is sympathetic. Everything has to fire physiologically in synchrony. And so much of the other, so much of the other neural monitoring that we do is asynchronous and the limbs, our limbs can, they fire so, so independently. I have always assumed that a given sphincter muscle or even um, some of the pelvic floor musculature, if you fire one side, it tends to cause the other side to fire, say that anal sphincter, the external anal sphincter. But I don't know. Um, when, when we, what some of your data shows a response on one side or the other for the anal sphincter. And to have you guys thought about what synchrony does to our neuromonitoring of the pelvic floor? I really don't have a clue. That's some very good questions because in the pelvic floor, we have, it's very different from the regular neuromonitoring we are doing for SSP or MEP because now we have sympathetic plexus and parasympathetic plexus. The sympathetic plexus originate from the lumbar roots. So it's T, uh, LT1 to L2, but parasympathetic has origin from brainstem and from sacral roots. So if you're doing transcranial stimulation, you are activating the the brainstem, which is actually not controlling the, the pelvic muscle, they are going to the more cranial side, but it's activation um, of all the both sides bilaterally. And as uh, Brett, you said, in order to activate the parasympathetic system, the sympathetic has to relax. So you cannot have stim because even we are stimulating both at the same time, or we are stimulating nerves which have sympathetic and parasympathetic, and it's stimulating both at the same time but both have to activate in antagonist way. So if a sympathetic is not relaxing and parasympathetic is not activating, it's not going to work. But there's so much data, there's so much different things. So at a micro level, we have to do, uh, we are very far away from that point. Um, I, I want to encourage the audience, keep, if any of this, uh, um, brings more questions, please feel free to keep the questions coming. Um, here was a question that um, uh, after an ovaric surgery, I developed overactive bladder. Is there a way of monitoring the detrusor muscle? I had no symptoms of neurogenic bladder before. And this is something that comes up constantly when we think about our neuromonitoring, monitoring, smooth muscle. Um, and, and it, it is, I, I have been asked a question of before of how are you, how are you sure that you're monitoring somatic, um, when you're, um, let's say from the urethral, um, because we are, it is surrounded by smooth muscle. So, um, is there a way of monitoring the detrusor, the smooth muscle? So. The, there, are, there are multiple papers published mostly from Germany and they are the way for monitoring those muscle intraoperatively is using a pressure electrode. So the same um, uh, bladder electrode, you have a 
pressure measured. So you are monitoring actually. The, so one of the slide, if you go back once you are reviewing the slide from one of the uh, presentation, uh, monitoring of pressure manometry during the surgery as well as EMG. So right in US, we don't have that intraoperatively measurement. So it's mostly clinical measurement, but we can do that. So intraoperatively, we it's a possibility and it's being used right now in different countries using a pressure monitor, which is direct measurement of the detrusor mm -hmm. muscle. So that and that that correlates well with detrusor activity, uh, just a, a linear relationship between pressure and that's that's assumed to just indicate detrusor activity. Correct. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, there is oh, wow. Here's an here is the urethral electrodes are homemade or available on the market. Um, they're they're not homemade. They're available on the market. Um, the uh, let me see. Um, do you have experience with cervical spine surgery? Are TCMEP from external urinary sphincter modified in a significant way during surgery? Do you have do you have experience with cervical spine surgery? Are TCMEP from external urinary sphincter modified in a significant way during surgery? I'm not sure what that question is answer is asking. Do you guys have any thoughts? So if you're talking about monitoring of the bladder during the cervical spine surgery, so we haven't done yet. The highest um, level we have done is L5S1. So I'm not gone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next question. Um, it always must be, um, uh, must have MEP from external anal sphincter and bladder or have external anal sphincter can predict injury. Um, it's always must have MEP from external anal sphincter and bladder or have external anal sphincter can predict injury. So that's a very good question. And that's the one of the basis of this presentation, having multimodality because until now we were recording MEP from anal sphincter and assuming the pudendal nerve is fine. But the pudendal nerve is not going only to the external anal sphincter. Pudendal nerve has uh, motor fibers. It has sensory fibers, has sympathetic and parasympathetic all input. So the, if you have still have intact anal sphincter muscles, external anal sphincter, patient can still wake up with a neurogenic bladder. So, and, and the surgeries, especially uh, the studies, uh, I was reviewing the literature, the abdominal perineal resection surgeries, they have a 50% chances of a post-operative um, uh, uh, urogenic bladder. The low anterior resection, uh, LAR, or the meso mesorectal uh, uh, colon surgery resection, they have about 15 to 25% risk of uh, urogenic bladder. So if you add external unitis factor, you are monitoring the roots of the pudendal nerve, which are going to the, the bladder, as well the roots going to the external anal sphincter. So those terminal roots are in, affected, which is most likely in those pelvic surgeries, you can identify separately. But if you're monitoring a spine surgeries or tethered cord, very quad equina, then uh, both will be, uh, it's very difficult to have one affected, but not the other because you are more proximal to the terminal branches. So they are independent of each other in the pelvic floor surgeries, but at quad equina or high level, uh, they are more synchronous. Um, here is a uh, here's a interesting question because BCR responses are sometimes unstable, appear and disappear, adding pudendal, and I assume that that's talking about the per, uh, the perineal evoked responses and external anal sphincter in the same procedure would be mandatory, right? It is my experience, and this is from Dr. Santiago Sanz. Is that, are you, is that your experience? So we cannot say mandatory because you are stuck in catch 22. If you say mandatory or have um, mandatory, then if somebody is not doing that, then you are stuck. So uh, until we have enough people who are certified or trained to do every single case and do both have activity, you cannot mandate that. So having, so we are stuck between catch 22. So we cannot cause mandation, 
uh, mandatory until we have trained people and we cannot have trained people. So anyway, so it's always recommended to do both of them. Uh, and it will take a while uh, to train people and have enough people to do. Otherwise, you have to cancel the case and until somebody shows up with experience. Um, so here is uh, here's an interesting question, Katie. It'll be uh, yeah. I'm sure you're going to have a thought on this. Do you think it is? Um, Javier Gonzalez asks his question: Do you think it is possible to monitor BCR for one week old baby in a surgery for neural tube defect correction? Very interesting question. Hmm. I haven't done it. I think it's worth a shot. <laughs> Faisal, what do you think? So, so I have to go back, but I don't know how youngest, but you can do the BCR on one month, but you, you have to use the surface ele needle electrodes for that. And this was one week old. One week, oh, okay. I thought one month. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's oh, one, yeah, I'm, one week. I, I'm sorry. One Perhaps week, okay. I read it wrong. Yeah. It's it's one asking for a one week old. Seven yeah. seven days old. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I have not never tried on one week BCR, so I'm, I'm not going I to think, do this. <laughs> yeah, be, yeah. I think like it, what's important too is you know what Faisal was saying about right. Like we we don't have all the answers. None of us have all the answers, and it's up to all of us, all of us in the field, to to start working on finding answers and looking for um to make use of those opportunities i guess okay Black. next next question <laughs> can the needles damage any blood vessels of penis so the the i think where i've been placing them for the bilateral stem and i think i'll pull those pictures way back here um, is not actually on the penis itself, but uh, above it. Let's find. Wow, it's way back here. Sorry, guys. So you have Maybe to stimulate, you use the surface electrode if you are using the dorsal surface of the penis. Yeah. Uh, while, but if you're using on the base of the penis, then you can use needle and Oh, it went too far now. <laughs> yeah, so the the location that I've now been finding preferable. So this would be with your surface electrodes. Oh, it's right here. And you just place the needles right right there. Okay, so let me get back. Got a lot of a lot of windows going on. Ah, John Umina, have you noticed scenarios where the catheter has produced EMG or TCMEP traces, while a conventional pair of external anal sphincter electrodes have not? I assume that he is talking about needles. Have you noticed scenarios where the catheter has produced EMG or TCMEP? Um, responses while conventional needles, anal sphincter have not. So the two papers we published, they are available online. And so we have much higher. So with, with EMG, we had 100% success rate with the, with the catheter. And on those patients, the anal sphincter was less than, it was less than 80%. For MEP, their success rate was, um, we had, um, 79%, 83% as compared to TCM uh, from anal sphincter, which was less than, uh, less than this. So the success rate for both EMG, trigger EMG and MEP was much higher as uh, on the bladder for our study comparing to external anal sphincter. And there were more robust responses. So is the question asking, is it possible like for triggered EMG to get a response isolated to just the urethral sphincter or just the anal sphincter? I think that's the question. And I yes. think, I think I, I'm, you know, again, we're all still learning. I think that it's possible and it's not common though. So I, I've, like you can see in this, um, you know, pretty large responses from the urinary sphincter, maybe just a small um, 
left anal sphincter response. And then I had another one as well. I was trying to see if I could find any where this scenario occurred, um, where there were responses. Um, so at this location of stimulation, there was responses from the anal sphincter, but not from the urinary sphincter. And then another spot where there were responses from both. I, I've got a question based off of this, and I, I think I know the answer, but I'm interested in your take. The, there's spatial se separation in onus nucleus for the neurons related to the external urinary sphincter and, the, and those uh, related to the external anal sphincter. They're spatially separated in onus nucleus a little bit. Um, do you think that the differentiation that you're seeing is coming from um, the different pathways that the rootlets that enter there uh, that the fibers that ultimately we go the perineal path the, the perineal pathway to say the external urinary sphincter do you think that the differentiation comes more from the anatomical route that those thing those pathways are going or is it possibly due to some of the differentiation in onus nucleus? That's a definitely possibility because onus nucleus is doing, uh, is just focused on the parasympathetic pathway, but the sympathetic pathway is coming to, uh, from a different, from the fiber outside the... the... I thought that wasn't um, onus nucleus also the somatic, related to the somatic? Maybe I was wrong. Um, I can, I'll double check, but, um, but yeah. well, um, the, uh, next question, um, from Dr. Martinez, I am doing intraoperative monitoring, uh, during Da Vinci TME. Not sure what TME is. Do you think BCR monitoring is useful during this kind of case? So TME, total mesorectal resection for the colorectal surgery. So, cause, so if you're doing, again, for the, these TME surgeries, um, urogenic bladder is, is, has a very high post-operative, you have a risk of urogenic bladder. So having a BCR monitoring, uh, BCR monitoring will give you the pudendal nerve reflex. So, so just doing the regular trigger EMG during this procedure, which is typical people are doing, cannot give you 100% coverage. So having a BCR monitoring can add all the pathway which are involved in that, which include the sensory motor and uh, so it's, it's going to be like additional. Um, and once you have a changes in both of them, then there are more specific changes. So you can, the sensitivity is much higher with change in BCR and the direct stimulation. Um, we are coming to the end of our time. Um, in fact, right now we're at uh, an hour and 40 minutes. Um, why don't we extend for 10 more minutes for anyone who can stay on? Um, but it's important for everyone who, uh, who is out there to know at the conclusion of this, um, we have a recording it is going to be posted on YouTube where everyone can see the complete recording. Um, and we will be emailing out a link to everyone who, who is here uh, and who registered, in fact, to view that recording. Um, so if, if you need to go, um, thank you for attending. We are going to stay on because there seem to be more questions coming in. We're, we're going to give it uh, just 10 more minutes and then we will, uh, we will conclude. Um, and now I'm a little bit lost here as far as all of the um, new questions. Um, um, what do you think about monitoring bladder pressure and its use in surgeries like um, selective dorsal rhizotomy. I know you've discussed that a little bit, but you want to talk about that more? So you can use the blood electrode the pressure monitoring, but when you're doing selective dorsal root, root rhizotomy, we 
intentionally spare the secular roots. We don't cut S2, S3, S4 roots. So if you do rhizotomy, you are going to do um, uh, split the nerve roots from L1 to S1. But once, if you stimulate the nerve and you identify the nerve is S2 or S3, we are not going to do rhizotomy because there's a more risk of damage than that. So typically it's not done. So having a blood pressure may not give an additional benefit for these cases, but having um, you adding an EMG for that trigger EMG will maybe benefit because if for some reason you cannot identify the root from the anal sphincter, you can have an, a backup electrode from the urinary sphincter so you can have a trigger EMG. So for, uh, again, for SDR cases, uh, rhizotomy, so for a trigger EMG may be more beneficial than doing the blood pressure for those surgeries. Um, here's an interesting discussion, and in, it brings up an interesting question. Um, Monica, I'll, I forgive me, but the last name is Belmonte, um, says we are currently working on characterizing surface EMG recordings of pelvic floor muscles, but neurological activity can be of great interest too. So this brings up a question that that I that is constantly on my mind is morphology, density, number of turns, just in general, the robustness of the EMG activity that we get. To what extent do, do you guys um, get information from just how strong the responses are? Or I, I, I think the answer is you're just looking for gross activity. If you see a compound burst, you're happy. Is that correct? From your yes. em, from your yeah. EMG? Yeah, right. Right now we have not analyzed. Again, uh, we need to analyze. So right now we are happy with compound muscle selection potential, and we have uh, most of the time is polyphasic, multi multiphasic response. Um, so the next step we can do that we can analyze is collect the data and do the uh, area under the curve. So how much uh, activity and and also reference that to the th th intensity of stimulation, the nerve roots. So even, so S2, S3, S4, S1, they are going to give, everyone is going to give you a different threshold. So if you are stimulating, so it's not a very, uh, consistent stimulation because S3 has the most contribution to the bladder, but S2 has contribution and S4 and some one. So you need to, we still have not correlated the data, the amplitude of the response and the morphology and the area recover uh, to the intensity of the stimulation and of course pulse fault and everything. And you know what, Faisal, as, you, as you're talking, it is so hard to try to do any assessment on morphology yeah. simply because of some, it's like some of the work you were showing yeah. on the deeper needles. You know, the closer you are to the source that you get higher frequency activity. And because of the quadrupole nature of EMG, you're going to quickly attenuate to high frequencies. Say if you're using a, a surface electrode, you're, you're going to have tremendously attenuated to high frequencies although you might get those nice um, uh, uh, um, slow waves of, of, of EMG, it all depends on the electrodes, doesn't it? Yeah, well said, Brett. So closer you get, you get much higher frequency and much better amplitude, and you are recording in multiple dipoles. You're not on one dipole. So more far you get, you get more, uh, uh, you get on a dipole. So you get closer, you get higher multi uh, quarter pole or maybe more and the second thing is you lose the stimulation artifact so we have to be seen with the surface electrode we have huge stimulation artifact because of the curve stray current spreading over the skin but comparing to the deep electrode we have minimal to no stimulation artifact right um i uh <laughs> forgive me guys i'm a poor moderator i am lost as i'm looking at the questions and i'm confused as far as the ones that i have brought uh to the presenters and the ones i haven't but let me go back because i think there were some in the beginning that i missed um are there uh, the, here was one um are there any study for autonomic part 
of pudendal nerve. And Faisal had already yes. said, yes, there are paper published monitoring autonomic system. And you talked about the autonomic system. Do you have anything to add about the, uh, the autonomic aspect? So, so again, um, so the autonomic nervous system is, is supplying your bladder electrode, uh, sorry, your bladder muscles, your rectal muscles, and the prostate. So those are the three um, organs in the lower pelvis, which is supplied mainly by the autonomic nervous system. So we can do those, we do those monitoring when you're doing trigger EMG for sympathetic or parasympathetic plexus or autonomic nervous system, we are activate, activating those muscle fibers in sphincters, bladder sphincter, in sphincter, and uh, nerves going to the prostate. So, so, so the whole monitoring intra pelvic area is covering the autonomic nervous system. And also forgot to mention is the bladder pressure. So having a bladder pressure, adding that's all. Uh, so the autonomic nervous system can be monitored and it's being monitored. Um, here was one and, and it, it, you had already answered this, Faisal, but it is an interesting question. Dr. Tello, I, uh, Armando Tello, um, who, speak, who, who is a frequent presenter, um, uh, he asked, from where do you start to measure MEP latencies? From time zero or from the one-third of the start of the TCMEP stimulation? And Faisal, you had answered from zero, but this brings up an important question. Yeah. Do, do you guys really look at anything other than just a gross indication of latency? I mean, is so it, are, is it yeah. worthwhile? So what we are looking at um, beside the latency, we are, uh, you're just talking about latency or, so we are looking at latency and we are looking for morphology and morphology of the waveform. Is it a, it's a multi-phase, a multi, uh, they have, three peaks or four peaks or five peaks, how many peaks are, and how much is changing throughout the surgical procedure. Um, so that's, but uh, right now, the problem is like, if you start measuring the latency from the third, uh, one third or in the middle after zero, and in the, during the surgery, you have to change your, the, your stimulation parameters. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're getting very good response at four trains, and then you have to change to five trains. And if you start from last train, then the latency will change. You can, we also do double train. So in the middle of mm -hmm. case, you have changes, you do double train. And if you double train, then so the interpretation goes off the roof. So, so until we get a, like a very good, uh, some uh, studies that tell the difference between, that can compare the difference between the two. So it's much easier for people to people who are getting into the field or they're, they're trying to start recording is to start with a zero because then all those other factors plays in. Easily. And I think it's important to pay attention of the late, to the latency of the other muscles, right? So it's all patient dependent. And like Hazel's saying, if you're changing your ISI or you're changing to double train in the middle of the surgery, you know, it's going to completely change the latency on the screen. Um, and so I think it's important to kind of know what's the comparison between, you know, your foot muscle and your hand muscle and your urethral sphincter response. Where, where do they fall in time comparatively to each other? Yeah, that visual of, am I looking at the right thing compared when yeah. I look at everything else, right? Yes. Okay. So last question, because we're, uh, we, we really do need to stop. We're a little over time here, but, and this is Katie, this is something that I thought about, uh, during your, your presentation. Um, this is, uh, is it better to shave the site prior to placing electrodes and tape because ouch. <laughs> and also what is the reliability of tape? I wondered that, I mean, do you, you, do you, I, I, you can see that in some instances you had to shave. And what about like Tegaderm? What, what are your tape options that you, what's everything you've tried? So um, I definitely think if it's extremely hairy and you have a razor available, it's definitely not a bad idea to go ahead and do. Um, I, I haven't had, while using needles, I really haven't had a lot of issue. And I think it's partly just from, having set up so many patients, you kind of get a, a technique. And for me, I know what works well is um, when you place it in, just kind of having that extra little bit of lead of the wire 
um, that when you tape it down, it's kind of smushed up a little bit with itself for lack of a better way to explain it and, and stress loops. So that way, you know, if it gets yanked or pulled or such that there, there's a certain amount of it that can be yanked and pulled without the electrode coming free. Um, I'm partial to the silk tape. Um, I, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I do use like Tegaderm and stuff like that on the face and the head. Um, I don't think it's necessary down there, but if it, it, you find that it sticks better for you, it kind of is, in, it, it's going to be individualized. Like what do you find kind of works for you? For me, I, I love the silk tape. I think it, it works really well. And I, I don't usually have a lot of sensitivity. That's another concern, right? It's like the sensitivity of the patient's skin to tape, um, especially if it's a lengthy procedure. Um, but, and, and, you know, for like example, the anal sphincter uh, electrodes, uh, again, just you're using those longer electrodes, it helps them stay a little bit more secure and in, in place. And I don't put any tape on, at all on the actual sphincter, but I make a nice big, a nice stress loop. And then I tape down behind that. And then I typically fold and tape down the stress loop. So then it, it kind of allows that electrode to, to be in place um, more securely. Right. I wonder how many technologists back when I was working as technologist, I constantly had silk tape all over me, ready to go. Um, <laughs> silk tape is our friend yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm a tega, tega dumb guy. So tega -derm guy. <laughs> tega -derm, because with the tega dumb, it's always more secure than yeah. silk tape because, and you can see that electrode. So that's another benefit. You can see that's you true. don't have to do it to come in, but it's yeah. like your choice. Uh, personal choice. So. Yeah. Well, um, we uh, thank you. I, I see comments coming in, um, thanking both of you, and I want to, um, I want to mirror that. Um, we really appreciate uh, phenomenal presentations. So thank you, everyone, and especially big thanks to uh, Katie and Faisal. Bye bye. Thank you, Brett. Thank thanks you. for hosting. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, everyone, for attending this.